some, yeah, some have the ma majorities. Uh, Like Where is he? <laughs> oh, he's not. Good morning, everyone. Um, come on in and have a seat, and we'll get started. Okay. 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 Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome, everyone. I, I see some faces in the audience that I saw yesterday, so welcome back. And for, for everyone else, welcome and thank you for coming today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Karen Marin. I am an advisor and contributor to Exxonsional, which is related to Exxons. We're kind of the... the um, the extension of Exxons. So if you like the feeling that you get at the show and in the seminars, um, please come over to the website and you'll see this continued 365 days a year on the web. So today we're going to talk about China and Korea. Um, just to give you kind of an overview, um, in recent years China has been a strategic market for luxury goods, including artisan fragrance. Um, China accounted for 21% of all luxury goods purchased in 2021. And lux however, luxury brands are cautioned to stop depending on the Chinese consumer. And if you think that since the, the pandemic, um, there were on and off COVID policies in China, there were recurring lockdowns, there were restrictions, um, rising prices, 
slowdowns of economic growth. Um, it's taken a toll on the consumer confidence in the economy. However, for the wealthy customer, it's still, it's not really an issue. It doesn't prevent them from shopping because they have the means. But for um, the growing middle class, and especially the new younger luxury consumer, they are less attracted by foreign goods and foreign names. So this is something that luxury, uh, that um, artistic perfumery brands need to be aware of. And it's something that we're going to talk about quite a bit in the uh, presentation today. Because there is a rising tide of nationalism in China. And so this is a shift towards interest in domestic brands, um, which uh, the panel has brought quite a nice selection for you to take a look at later on in the presentation. Um, in the meantime, we have Korea, which is coming into the limelight. Historically, it's held the largest piece of duty-free shopping. Uh, and since the pandemic, it's recognized as one of the fastest growing markets. And in fact, earlier this week, I read a statistic that said that um, because the lockdowns are eased in China and the people are traveling again, that they do travel th through Korea and the uh, travel retail numbers are up almost 30% in some shops. So this is a really good sign. Um, domestic sales of high-end niche perfumes are s exploding in Korea, and uh, the nationals are reported to be some of the biggest spenders in per capita of luxury product uh, in the world. So today I've brought together a group of panelists that um, are experts. So Marina Crosa, to my left, Regional Director, Asia Pacific, Business Development Coordinator, Europe for Niche Box. She's a fragrance industry executive with over 25 years of experience in global business development, strategic planning, global marketing, consumer behavior, knowledgeable about Asia Pacific, uh, Europe, oh, US, blah, 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 on and on. To my right, Michel Gutsatz, president of Le Jardin Retrouvé and senior marketing professor at Kedge Business School. Wealth of experience in all phases of brand development, strategy, management, from mass market to luxury brands. He has an intimate knowledge of the Chinese market, which has been gained through firsthand experience. On the far end of the panel, I have Matthew Rochette Schneider, uh, Greater China General Manager for Sandegrei. He has a knowledge of the China market and the consumer and the ability to create a strategic vision. He's been on the forefront of helping brands pursue international expansion. And then in the center, I have Chi Wang, founder, consultant at Fragrance Connection, He's a multi-talented executive with expertise in training, promoting fine fragrance in China and Asia. He's a, also a consultant in business development for the luxury goods market. And he works with a number of luxury brands um, and perfume houses to, uh, for training, to train the trainer. And he's a very good friend as well. You know, in fact, they're all good friends. So I wanted to bring them all together to really talk about what's happening and where the opportunities are. And so as we prepared for the workshop, we all discussed this rising tide of nationalism. And now Chi, I forgot how to pronounce it. It's Guo, Guo, Tao. Guo Tao. Okay. So I'm going to pass the clicker down to um, Matthew. But just to give you kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about this nationalism movement We'll talk about strategies for success in China. And then if we have time, <laughs> we'll go into fragrance use, clean beauty, and then things to avoid. Did you um, want to say something? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I want to say something. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to correct the figure because it has a huge impact on the discussion. And two figures. 
The first, you're saying that 21% of luxury goods are bought in China, which is true. What this uh, does not convey is that 30% of luxury goods are bought by Chinese, mm. which is a complete different story, which means that in fact, one third of all luxury goods worldwide are bought by Chinese, including mainland and overseas and traveling. This makes it now the number one group of consumers for luxury worldwide. And it's not going to stop. Whatever is being said here about local brands, about Go Chow, about it will not stop. So this has to be and second thing, you didn't include their figures for fragrance. No. Korea fragrance market is $400 million. China is $1.7 billion, so four times the size. Yeah. And it is predicted to be, in 2025, the number two worldwide market for fragrances behind the US. So once this is said, then we can see what is the role of local brands and international brands, etc. But my take here is to congratulate the 50 people who are in this room because we are leaving out hundreds of others who are not attending mm -hmm. and who unfortunately have not maybe grasped the issues around China, Chinese brands, Chinese consumers, and what the future will look for the fragrance industry in the coming years. Yeah, I mean, indeed, we did we did talk about this in our pre-preparation, um, but um, we have some slides that give you some numbers that uh, we can show you at the end. Um, and another thing, just uh, before we continue, is that um, the presentations are all recorded and will be available for replay in YouTube. Um, and then uh, we'll take questions at the end of the uh, workshop as well. So now, um, now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Matthew to talk about the nationalism. Hello, hello. Yeah. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, yes, I would like to talk to you a bit about um, what is the, the Guangzhou. Um, few very interesting stuff and why we are talking about uh, this, um, this movement today in the perfume show, um, because this new, uh, we, we call it the national nationalism wave, or you have many, many ways to, to, to define what is it. Um, the, the fragrance and the sense topic is a part of this movement. Why? Because uh, it's a category <coughs> who, which allow to, how to, say that, to, to, to talk about culture, heritage, um, local story, local history, and the perfume in the beginning of the COVID years, in 2020, uh, 2020 sorry, um, was one of the most um, interesting category of consumer goods to explain this, um, this rediscovery of uh, national story. A uh, few, um, uh, yes, I put a few information about what is Guocho because you will find a lot of interview, a lot of uh, article to define that. Um, you will see also that perfume, um, uh, alcohol and spirit, and also the, the tourism and leisure industry, uh, this, this three main category to uh, express uh, this national wave um, in China. Uh, I, I would like to show you three brands uh, that we design and I wanted to to show you three aspects of these national waves. Uh, totally different, you have to understand, it's exactly like uh, if you talk about the French style or about the Italian style, it's, you don't have only the red and, and dragon uh, uh, illustration, you have many, many ways to express that. And in perfume industry, you have many ways to express that. Uh, first of all, I think you, you probably heard a lot about this brand because since one year, it's the brand in China uh, the most um, successful. Look, Two Summer. Two Summer is a Beijing brand um, uh, who give 
developed a full story uh, related to the, um, uh, to the oriental garden, the, um, the, the scent in the garden, and this perfume was the most uh, iconic one uh, called Triple T, so three T together. Um, and uh, the, I really um, advise you to check online. The shops are incredible. The, the products are incredible. I don't know if you took some product. Yeah. Maybe you have took some one. With the green cap. Yeah. Yeah. This one of the fragrance. Apart from Parfum, they also have a lot of uh, home fragrance yeah. diffuser in their portfolio. And what is quite interesting also about these kind of uh, new brands super successfully quickly, also the business model at the beginning is quite um, different than in Europe. For example, to summer when I met them in 2020, uh, they have just few perfume, uh, not very well designed, but they created something which is based on we sell during only 20 minutes or one hour online and we just have few products and this brand became extremely uh, powerful uh, due to that. Can I add something? This is quite often used in China marketing tactic. They, we so-called a hungry marketing. So each time they only release very limited amount of products. So people kind of chasing for it. They say you start to sell at 8 a.m. Often, no, within five minutes, all product gone. So customer always try to catch their next launch. This is how they build up their kind of or everything based on limited supply. So it become quite famous in China in a very short period of time. Um, another example, completely different in terms of style, in terms of uh, positioning, and um, even for me more surprising than the, um, the first one. Uh, so the Forbidden City launched last year Uh, some perfumes. Uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, some uh, some perfume, which is a collection related to the the colors and the each each area of the Forbidden City. And for me, what is the most interesting about it? There is two stuff quite incredible about this uh, this launch. First of all, why perfume became so quickly in China? The expression of an heritage, because related to Forbidden City, you can launch, a, I don't know, piece of art, decoration, but why perfume? This is the key topic. Okay. And second, which is for me quite um, also personally touching, but why the Forbidden City decide to work only with European people to create perfume? Mm. I don't think, for example, that if the Versailles, uh, the Chateau de Versailles in France uh, launch a perfume, they will work with um, a Chinese company for the design, a Chinese company for the manufacturing. But this is another um, topic. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Forbidden City have a history launching uh, different beauty products. Before the, they launched the fragrance, they launched a lot of uh, color cosmetics as well. So it's part of their portfolio. Um, if you go to their museum store, you can buy all sorts of stuff from porcelain, both um, clothes, everything. So this is part of their assortment, which um, fragrance market in China have been expanded very fast in the past 10 years. So this is one of the reason they want to launch a series of fragrance. I think now they have two collection of fragrance. And we also bring along of some of the brands you see on the China market. A few first few, is there a pointer? No, okay. The first four is a perfumer brand. So the owner, is a perfumer and design their own fragrance and launch in market. So you got Ely, you got uh, Wobis, um, Roy from 
the sky and other aura. And other, you can see the document. Document is one of the most um, sophisticated local brand in China. They have a whole range of products, apart everything related to scents. So we have some display here. Also, based on the China concept, the, the kind of design you, you can see is very Chinese. And even the diffuser, um, the concept is come from the Pentagon. And we have Utorial. Utorial is a one of uh, quite early launch in China. Yeah. Um, based on all Chinese team, um, you know, tea, osmanta, all related to Chinese culture. And we have Revenual. It's a Revenual is right here. So they even work with master perfumer in all the big uh, fragrance houses, IFF, Juridon, you know, Feminish. Um, it's a local company. The original is an OEM for fragrance. Um, a, a few years ago, they planned to launch their own brand, and they only sell through their own standalone boutique. In the boutique, you can even do customization or, you know, quite an interesting brand. And we have male season, uh, this uh, seven inch nine, two summer already mentioned, uh, Mason this set, this set, yeah. So all uh, the local brand in the market in the past few years, some even just launched in during the pandemic, like let's say this one is just launched during the pandemic, is a crossover between a perfumer and a fashion brand, a local fashion designer brand. So every not, there is a lot of new brand launched in China. For myself, you know, really in a five market research, you know, figure market research can't even catch up the kind of pace of new brands in the market. It's really, really overwhelming. And um, just to, to put in um, my own personal view, the other night, Chi and I got together and he brought over about 10 fragrances to show me what he was bringing and for me to be able to smell them. And, you know, I'm originally American, but now based in Paris, working with Italians. Um, so I come with a very Western um, association to fragrance. And I have to say that the scents, to me, they were very unique. They were very different, something that I wouldn't have um, probably purchased for myself. But it's just to show that, that there is a market for something that is quite different than what is um, available on the, on the European American market. And I think it's, it's quite important that brands consider that the taste of the local customer would be different and do the research to look into it. Um, Michelle, yeah. what yeah, would yeah. you like to add? Well, I'd like to add something <laughs> because um, this topic uh, it's not surprising. Uh, it's not surprising. Uh, it's been happening in all the categories. It's happening in everywhere, okay? You know, when France was said to be the country of perfume, and when all of a sudden you have a brand like Le Labo, which uh, sort of makes us believe that they are French, okay? when they are not at all, okay? Uh, period, period, it's finished, okay? It just means that fragrance has become global and there are brands that are born in Australia, mm -hmm. brands in New Zealand, in Sweden, okay? By Redo, for instance, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's all, and now China. And it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal, okay? Mm -hmm. Same thing for cosmetics has been happening, 
yeah. uh, K-Beauty and then C-Beauty and, and L'Oreal and uh, Estee Lauder are not the only uh, brands in the world. This is competition yeah. and this is uh, the, the only difference for fragrance is that there's still a small advantage for French brands because France is equated to f the country of fragrance. Which is why also, as Mathieu was saying, they are going for French design companies, for French perfumers, for et cetera, et cetera, to give some legitimacy to, the, uh, to, to their endeavor. But that's just the market. So the brands, all of them, have just to know that unless they, are, they have a strong authenticity, okay, that they are built as a brand and not as a sum of products, mm -hmm. okay, then they will have to fight a very a competition with local brands, okay? And, yeah. No, yes, and also, just to react a bit what, uh, what said Michel, and uh, I know very well the, this topic, um, thanks to, to Michel and the, the, the job we made together for Le Jardin Le Trouvé in China, that for all your projects and all what you are thinking about your business in China, what is so interesting about China business of perfume today, it's that there is no taboo, you know? There is no taboo about uh, who I am, I am French, I am Chinese, I am, it's absolutely not what is important. What is important is what at the end, the creativity, the creation, the marketing, the storytelling. You know, for example, you list some, some, uh, some brands, if you take each of these brands, you will discover a story which is absolutely not a classic story. For example, Voice from the Sky, I know super well this guy, this is a Chinese, a Chinese uh, guy, the son, uh, his father was an OEM, the first OEM perfume uh, factory in, in the countryside next to Tianjin. Tianjin. He went to Lisipka, he, he, he go back to Tianjin, he created this brand. Enfin, this is what is so interesting in China today, and it's so interesting for your project. If you have a brand, go to China, create something unbelievable as we made <laughs> with Michel, uh, because there is no taboo. I'm not sure whether he's here or not, because he is, he's told me he is in no, he's not the here. venue today. But he's not so in the room. <laughs> My final point on this topic is that I'm convinced that next year, at Exxons, we will have Chinese brands exhibiting. Definitely. Oh, Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Good but for Exxons, good for the market. Yeah. Okay, we're going to put China on hold for a minute. <laughs> and switch, uh, move over to Korea. And I'm going to hand the clicker over to Marina. <laughs> the microphone as well. As my colleagues uh, said, uh, yeah, Asia is a very important part of, of the global market for the brands. And the question is, uh, where should we go? And of course, China, high potential low penetration, so it's really interesting, but it's also very complicated. Complicated to enter, to penetrate, but also to maintain. Uh, while on the other side, Korea is uh, more mature and uh, less versatile, I would say. So uh, it's a very attractive market. Uh, in terms uh, of uh, perfume sales, they are, as uh, said, on the rise, absolutely. Uh, they, they are, they has always been a leader in the beauty industry. Skincare for Korea is really a cultural product. But uh, perfumes uh, is becoming really a hero. Uh, and uh, um, there is a difference because uh, perfume is a popular, but popularity is moving from uh, fashion brands to niche. And this is really very important. Niche brands are increasing, growing very fast and still expected to grow. Uh, but uh, fashion premium brands are struggling and the mass market uh, is really suffering. Uh, so it's very, very uh, uh, essential for us uh, to understand uh, that there is a big potential because the uh, Korean market is not afraid of innovation, is uh, not afraid of uh, very unconventional creations and uh, very stylish. Uh, don't forget that uh, 10 Corsa Como opened its second store in 2008, I think, in Seoul. 
So it means that consumers are really very open-minded, very curious, uh, very experimental. And uh, just like China, uh, yeah, the sales are driven, uh, the major consumers uh, are the MZ generation. So very young, very dynamic uh, consumers uh, which want to try to discover new brands. And that's why they are looking for an uh, interesting uh, uh, niche brand. And the market is dominated by international foreigners, mainly European brands. But what is surprising, and I was completely amazed to discover, that there is a, a long historical uh, scent culture in Korea. And uh, yeah, I think it dates, I think uh, it's recorded, uh, it dates back to the fifth century. And uh, incense, uh, agar wood, uh, herbs were used. And at the royal court, there were master perfumers. Uh, artisanal, of course, but they had this habit to wear, to have with them perfumes. Uh, not uh, the perfumes we know today, of course, but incense with burners or herbs or even a mask, a deer mask, and they kept it in pouches. And it's uh, decorative, but it's also therapeutic. So, uh, longer tradition, and this longer tradition, we can see it uh, today, like exactly like in China, in this new trend, it's a perfume wave of uh, new Indies brands. I was not lucky, uh, like uh, Chi <laughs> and Matthew were, to bring finished products, uh, only some discovery set, some samples, but uh, they are interesting uh, niche, um, they are based uh, mainly on tradition, uh, inspired by locations. Uh, they are very proud of their culture. Uh, the trend uh, is uh, really global, so mainly genderless, natural perfumes, very clean, uh, very cocooning. Uh, and uh, yeah, the consumption is uh, really higher. Uh, I think that another difference is that they are based on a lifestyle concept, uh, not only on fragrances. So it means that perfumes help to live better. So, yeah, looking better, smelling better, with a perfume life uh, can be nicer. Th this is uh, the motto. And uh, I think that this wave can really open the doors uh, to niche brands uh, to Korea, where from another point of view, it's easier to penetrate because the uh, regulations, restrictions are not so tough as in China. Of course, the products have to be registered, but it, uh, it's uh, easier and uh, you have to guarantee only the freshness uh, of the products. Uh, so I think that uh, the sensibility of the new consumers, uh, yeah, make, uh, make us a dream and uh, really build uh, the success uh, of the future. And we see that the distribution is also different because uh, it's more homogeneous. Uh, the market uh, is based essentially on uh, duty-free stores, of course, uh, where the sales uh, of fragrances uh, is uh, really very high, incredibly, especially now after lockdown. But they could buy even during lockdown in some special places uh, like uh, the Jeju Island, you know, it's yeah. a duty-free zone where there, there was no limit in purchasing, so consumers uh, could go and buy whatever they wanted. And uh, yeah, the duty-free is uh, not a competitor of the domestic market, which is also very strong. And in both the duty-free and the department store domestic market, the perfume rate of sales is growing. And niche is really a top sellers. Uh, of course, uh, we don't speak about uh, statistics uh, and the numbers, but anyway, it means that uh, you can, uh, uh, just to, to, to be present, to give uh, brand awareness and uh, solidity, consistency to your brand, to look after the right partners. Yeah, there are some uh, golden rules 
because I deliver you my experience uh, as brand. So for me, it's important, uh, first of all, uh, to know the market. And that's why I was surprised to see that there is a long uh, uh, cultural center tradition in Korea. So that's why perhaps people are also um, more inclined to, to understand the new, new perfumes, uh, new directions. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, the domestic markets uh, uh, have different uh, consumers. Uh, uh, compared uh, to the duty to the duty free so uh, it's important to find the right partners and the first rule for me is really knowledge of the market and looking after the right partners for a long lasting uh, uh, relationship because uh, the right partners know the the consumers habits can help you identify new forecast uh, for your brand and uh, relate to maintain a strong relationship with the retailers, but especially with the consumer. So it's uh, a very large market, all, all, always uh, very well expanded and present. Uh, there are over 60 department stores and over 70 duty-free stores. So uh, the offers is very wide. And uh, yeah, the main cities are, are two uh, where you can find everything. It's uh, Seoul and Busan, the port. But anyway, it's easy to, to get your, your perfumes. Of course, uh, online overseas cross-border is a thread, but uh, until today, yeah, uh, <laughs> th th there was an option. Now it's uh, also important uh, to find uh, a, a partner and uh, just to bring uh, with you your story because people uh, love uh, really to get a story, uh, to read uh, ingredients, uh, so they are looking uh, for consistency for long-term brands as well, not only <laughs> for long-term partnership, as Michael said, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really the, the golden rule. And then, but it's of course more business oriented, uh, the pricing policy, it's important to get only one pl player, partner, to control the price. So that's why two main channels, duty-free, domestic, but if you have only one partner, it's easier to control the price, to align it, uh, retail price, with everywhere, every country uh, in, in the world. And so I think it's uh, really a new wave uh, which allows us uh, to be more present uh, as, uh, of course, other international fashion brands are and where, but make our presence uh, more consistent uh, and more uh, long-lasting. That's... Uh, the point of view of the brand, I don't want it to annoy anymore, but I'm here for any questions or uh, more in-depth discussion. Yeah, can I add something? Um, if you have a question about why all of a sudden Chinese fragrance market become huge, China also have a very long history in using fragrance in an instant way. It's a more than 2,000 years history. And this culture was you know, export to Japan and Korea during the uh, Tang Dynasty. This is where the root form. So you see the bottle design, even this uh, Japanese knife is like a copy of Smith bottle in the history. So that's the reason why the linkage and people start to rediscover to use fragrance to perfume themselves. And China market have some similarity to Korea. You really need to be careful to find the right partner. Some brand was ruined by the so-called distributor in China. They are not building a brand. They just, a lot of China you know, trading company, they just want to make quick money. So they can sell low direct to customer or they sell to uh, not supposed to be the, not supposed to distribute to that type of client. So the price control is uh, in a mess. So one of the really golden key point is find a trustworthy business partner in Asia. Dr. Narash, of course, I yeah. add, and uh, 
ready to invest, so P&L <laughs> <Yes. laughs> can be negative, mm. of course, but then it's just uh, to, to get a duration of your brand and uh, more consistency, of course. So. Uh, may I add something on M Marina, what Marina yeah. said about Korea? Mm -hmm. um, first thing is that, as you've noticed, uh, you all know that department stores are dead or dying. Okay, in the US, uh, Europe, okay, not in Korea. Korea, they're very strong. And the entry point in Korea is department stores. And I think this is very important. The second point is that uh, between department stores and travel retail, the so-called good partner, and we'll discuss this later, what is a good partner, uh, should first take you domestic and not travel retail because travel retail is a cutthroat business okay where the major brands are dominating okay and that should come only later if you're successful on domestic now there is a specificity of the korean market which we've seen okay and which i think is very interesting and in this sense, it's very different from the Chinese market and more mature than the Chinese market. It is now focusing on creating new venues, new formats, or shopping shops, focusing on natural beauty. Everything which is sustainable, natural, pure, all the, all which comes, in fact, coming from the US, okay? But Korea will be the sort of number one country in Asia to really go in this direction with specific retail formats created for that. Uh, and it means that they will be separating the standard niche or standard selective from the clean beauty and the natural beauty. This is very important because it means that niche brands that really have a argumented claim uh, on this will find retail locations uh, which are really tailored to them and they will not be mixed with all the others. Yeah, that's why we have to choose very carefully yeah. the partner. Yeah. The but partner. I, I strongly believe that uh, it depends on the size of the brand, mm. but business has to be integrated. Exactly. And just to finish on the good partner that Key and Marina said, you know, it's very good, it's very simple to say good partner, but what, good, what does good partner mean, okay? Uh, we've tried, I don't know, 10, 15 uh, possible partners in China. Uh, you know, people promising you a JV in the Virgin Islands, uh, <laughs> things like that. Um, um, or, or then you're the, you're, you're so small that in their portfolio of 40 plus brands, uh, they, they, they take care of you for one year and then forget you. Or, they, uh, or you come in and they understand that you want quick cash wins. So they, because you need cash, so they take you across border and you do quick cash, but a year or two later, you're dead because you've been discounted uh, yeah. so many times, okay? So price control, identity control, brand identity control, all that is fundamental, but it means taking time and finding one out of 10 that will be the good partner. But the good partner, you know, it's a question, the problem in China, for instance, the problem in China is that you will find a partner which is really good in online, and you will find, but not good in offline. And you may find a partner which is good in offline and so, so in online. Ha, huh, how do you deal with that? Okay, how do you deal with that? That's a real business issue because you've got in China to be both. You've, get, you've got to be omni-channel. So you've got to make a decision. Do I first go online? Okay, and of course, if you want to go online, you can go cross-border. But the potential of cross-border ultimately is not as good as you if you are certified and can go offline too. 
because simultaneously you need a flagship store or a corner or a physical presence, even if it's a few stores. So it's, it's a real business decision. And it's really, you've, the, the only way to do that is to take the time to control the registration. Never give your registration to a third party. Never, ever. Okay? Do it yourself. You can do it from whichever country you are in with specialized agencies who will do the registrations for you. Okay? But never hand it out to someone. You will never recover it. Right? So, plus price. Because if you have two partners, one for online, one for offline, huh, how can you enforce that the price is the same on both channels? Because as soon as you accept that a partner tells you, oh, but you know, in China, online is discount. You're dead. Yeah, You're dead. Yeah, complete that <laughs> in a, a year or two. A year or two, okay? So many stories like that. <coughs> so you've got to be able to give full price. Of course there are promotions. Of course, you, if you go on Petit Mall, you have to be on the festivals and you have gifts and you have promotions. But the price is controlled and customers know what the price is compared to the EU price or wherever you are. So all this is real business decisions that you have to make when choosing the right partner. So there are more don'ts than do's, I would say, in a sense, before you start and identify the correct uh, partner to, to go with. The main do is uh, be ready to spend money to invest. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, and you cannot be successful. Yeah. Or find yeah. a partner which has deep yeah. pockets. Yeah. <laughs> Choose your business model as the most appropriate one, but yeah. And for the product uh, registration, uh, you can do, do it remotely by uh, so-called uh, agents. And also, you can, if you already have a partner in China, you can ask them to help you to do it. but. All the name is registered under your yeah. parent company name. They are only as a so-called local respo responsible, responsible person. person. And this local responsible person can be changed. Yeah. And a few stuff about all what we, we said. First of all, um, about Asia and especially China, and especially in fragrance, but it's true for many categories, but for fragrance. All the articles that you will read, all the experts that you will meet, 100% time, 99% enfin time, <laughs> it's absolutely bullshit. Yes. But absolutely. Because me, for example, since yeah. 10 years in China, I heard every year perfume will never succeed in China because Chinese perfume doesn't use, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Don't use doesn't use perfume. Huh? After... Uh, 25 centuries of uh, perfume history, uh, just during the 20th centuries, it's true that perfume disappeared, but, huh? or um, last week, I had some things, for me, it's, the, it's my number one now, that be careful about your perfume, because the Chinese people have some small hands, and your perfume is too, too big. This is absolutely insane. <laughs> enfin, you know, imagine. <laughs> Look, all, uh, and also, now, the big trend is, be careful, because your perfume is too strong, and Chinese people doesn't like strong smell, which is absolutely not true. I so. think this is applied <laughs> to the whole Far East, not only China, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Korea and Japan as well. And in the Far East, they like small size, 50 milliliter, or if you have 30 milliliter, even better. No, no, this is a uh, what, very important point. Uh, second point, very quickly, about what Michel mentioned, find a good partner in China is not, Easy. it's absolutely not possible to be a perfect partner. Nobody, and don't try to have a perfect partner. It's absolutely not interesting to be perfect, and it doesn't exist. What is interesting is to find a partner which needs you and you need him. This is the most interesting. It, it, if he only needs you or only you need him, is not no. interesting. But what is interesting is the, the, the common point. And the last part, um, it's, um, it's about um, what Marina said, and I think it's quite interesting about the China and Korea story. Really, I advise you to check one brand. It's Tambourines. Alors, I don't know uh, exactly how we, we pronounce that, but it's a Korean brand of perfume mm. who are 
making like uh, something unbelievable, uh, unbelievable in China. Tambourines, alors T A M B U R I N S. It's unbelievable. What, how is it pronounced? Tom, uh, in French, it's tam tambourin. Tambourin. Oh, t no, like it's a really tambourine. It's absolutely, uh, me, I'm. Uh, it's the, the, my biggest uh, regret is I didn't design it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's unbelievable. Yes, and but it's exactly, Mathieu, if you want to Mathieu, understand yeah. the Gen Mathieu, Z today. Which br whose brand is it? Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Okay? Yeah, I know. No, no. Y you say to which group they belong. Now, what is unbelievable that perfume, this perfume brand, is coming from Gentle Monster. Oh, okay, don't don't know. Uh, and Gentle Monster is the brand who changed the retail uh, challenge in China, and not only in China, but especially in China, because from shop they create. Gentle Monster is eyeglasses. But it's not like, in, like we say, experience in store. But Gentle Monster is a brand of glasses. When you go to Gentle Monster, you don't see glasses. Uh, you will see a glasses maybe at the end of the, <laughs> the shop. You see only art. Okay. Uh, I, I want to add something there because this is fundamental. The retail landscape, retail landscape, which is so boring in the West, so boring, okay, is changing and change is coming from Asia and it's coming from China and Korea. Really. Okay. Um, we kind of started talking about um, fragrance use, and this was something that the group talked about in uh, general and in, in before we got together. Um, because we do, we, and just based on what we read, and then uh, you tell us if this is true, um, we read that there's a lot of interest in gender neutral. We read that there's a lot of interest in mood boosting fragrance. Um, we read that the consumer is really interested in self-expression, so they want something that's unique and not uh, something that everyone else on the street is wearing. Um, so I wanted to ask the group to kind of comment on what their observations on this is. Um, Michelle, do you want to start and then we can go to Matthew? Uh, fragrance use, well, Clean Beauty, I already mentioned it earlier, okay? Uh, but it has to be uh, proven. It has to be proven, okay? You can't just say I'm natural. You can't just say I'm clean or whatever. The standards are there. Let me give you an example. And business experience, okay? We used to have on our packaging a percentage of natural ingredients in our fragrances that we calculated. When we registered our uh, fragrances in China, the Chinese authorities to whom we send the packaging looked at the packaging and said, where does this figure come from? So we said, it's uh, ours. They said, third party certification, please. So it means that we went to a third party, which is uh, an agency in Europe, which makes all our certifications and our registration, and they delivered us a third party specification, certification saying there are 94.5% of natural ingredients in this fragrance. And we put it on the packaging and it's accepted in China. So it means that from China, we can say whatever we want about uh, regulations uh, and so high certification level, it is also a way to improve our own way of thinking and doing so that now that we have this certification, we can show it in Korea, for I instance. I totally agree with yeah. you. It yeah. make, yeah, yeah, yeah. It Saying, works. oh, you see, now we have a third party certification. Yeah. Good. And this is because of China, mm -hmm. not because of Europe or sure. US or whatever. You, you no. have to review all your formulas. Exactly, whatever. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so true. we reviewed all it's our formulas. We control. moved to organic yeah. alcohol. We, you know, we did a certain number of things like that, which allowed us to go beyond the 90% threshold where this certification was possible. So once we've done that, you come and you certify and you prove, and then you're accepted in these new retail channels, or you can, in China, put it on your packaging and have a story about it. 
And they are very careful yeah. on ingredients, absolutely. I agree with you. So this is one thing. The second thing about fragrance use, I think that there's something, and I think Chi and, 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 and Matthew uh, know it much better than I. Today, these Chinese brands, the storytelling they're doing, some of them, it's not just we're a Chinese heritage or whatever. No, no. They link, they link fragrance use to mood. Yes. To mood. What is your mood today? Okay? So you can speak about that. What I know is what we are doing to change things and to go in this direction. And here we are inspired by China also. So it's a two-way yeah. street. Okay? We at Le Jardin Retrouvé, because Givaudan is our um, supplier of concentrates, we own the formulas, but they supply us in concentrate. They also deliver to us certificates because they manufacture the concentrate. So of course they give us a vegan certificate. So we've got a proof of vegan. But it's not all. They have patents which show that if you use certain ingredients in certain proportions, it fits the patents that they are mood enhancers. So we have, and you can come and see us on our booth, four of our 12 fragrances which are certified as mood enhancers. One is, the one we're launching here, Oli, is a happiness mood enhancer, and we can tell people, be Oli, be happy, okay? We have another one which is about balance and well-being, another one for quality of sleep, another one for energy. And all of a sudden, this fits into the new fragrance use of the Chinese, which comes from China. And because I'm an engineer, I only like to show things which we can prove, okay? And not just, uh, I'm a marketing professor also, but I know that, you know, with marketing, you can say just about anything, especially if you're in the US. <laughs> but it's not possible anymore. It's not possible anymore. And especially in China, where customers have such high level of expectations and which are spreading worldwide, you know, in the U.S. now, the customers also have these high expectations. Can you tell me, prove to me that you're vegan? Okay, not just say, I'm vegan. Okay, so we need a third-party certificate. So all this changes completely the landscape. Okay, and we need to be able to prove it before the story starts. And the story coming out of China is about moods. Um, before to answer you about the unisex, uh, at the beginning of the... Um I just want to mention you that at the beginning of the conference, we talked about this incredible brand, Voice from the Sky, and the guy just arrived, yeah, like just really arrived. talk to him after the, yeah. the workshop. Uh, it's Mike, he say hello. Um, the, um, for the unisex, again, it's a bit like the small hands uh, and the strong perfume. Um, the, the topic, of fragrance unisex in China is totally, totally different than what we perceive about unisex. And it's not even the question of gender neutral. It's a question that the, the consumption, the codes, the, the, the storytelling, the smell, the everything between men and women is not the same code as us. It's basically nothing else. Really, it's, it's not something so much intellectual marketing. It's really the codes are not the same as us. You know, for example, Bleu de Chanel, the biggest population, <laughs> increasing population of the consumer of Blue Channel is women, for them. Not for their boyfriend or their husband, is for them. So this is the, the most important topic to understand in China. It was the same for skincare, and it's, really, it's related also a lot about Korea and Japan. For example, the celebrity, I don't know who, uh, who went to, to, to China or to Korea in the room already, but for example, in China, the advertising for female products are made May. by men. But this, you have to understand that the, the relationship between code about my gender is not the same. And as perfume in China is about express myself, but you express which part of your gender you want to express with the perfume. I, I think it's really important that we have you all here to tell us this because you know, I've never been to China, and yet I've read 
hundreds of articles about it. And so here you're like dispelling a lot of myths that, that are expressed in, uh, in print. So this is, this is really, really key information for the, for the crowd, for the audience, and for the future audience that will watch and replay. Um, <laughs> so I think, uh, I think we're pretty much done with the presentation because we did tell you a few things to avoid. But Chi, is there anything else you want to add before we move on to questions from the audience? Uh, for the China market, got one thing you really need to avoid. You never, as a brand, or even you work with any business partner around the world, never have anything in touch on the political side. Chinese is very sensitive about that. It can damage yourself. Yeah, political. So it can damage yourself, and it, it will take you know, more than a year or two for your brand to recover. You, you can ask to Dolce Gabbana. If yes, you're... exactly. How they feel after five years. <laughs> okay, um, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, at this time, let me see if there's any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask the panel. Yes? I mean, it's good to use Dragon also, but not only. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm saying, is there's a danger that you cannot design a product that runs into cliches, right? Or things that feel like they're just performative. So I'm just curious, from your discussions with your work with mostly Chinese brands, like what are the things that we in the United brands can learn? I mean, uh, the aesthetics, the, the, the it's, an excellent, uh, it's an excellent question, and unfortunately, we need to spend the afternoon on it. <laughs> but. Um, uh, if I can answer quite um, in the simple way or short way, the best solution to, to, to express a Chinese element is to talk about yourself. Is to talk about yourself, what you are, in terms of uh, Italian, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, French brand, etc. And to mix with Chinese element. But what is a disaster is to be more Chinese than Chinese. Mm. This is a disaster. Right? Yeah. It's like a, this is this, 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 this. <laughs> but the best best solution is really to, 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 to express some things about your own story. And the most um, what's uh, the most personal yeah. one. You know, for example, I give you one example and you will understand perfectly. The I, uh, just before COVID, I work um, a lot for a French uh, wine brand. And um, it, the guy doesn't know how to start in China. You know, it's a super big, big, big French wine brand. He doesn't know how to start because he wants so much to, to understand the Chinese culture, but he doesn't understand at all. And one year before COVID, it was the, the 70 years of the creation of PRC, of the China, modern China. And I, I, I visit the, the wine place of the guy and he has 70 bottles from his father made in 1949, the, the year of the creation of uh, China. And he offered these 70 bottles from his father's personal collection to some key people in China. But trust me that um, since that, he doesn't have problem of business. Because it's, it you know what I mean? It's, well. yeah. And Korea is exactly because the same. Uh, just as an example, the name of this new brand is non-fiction. It means be yourself. You have to show who you are, your emotions, your feelings. I think that yes. this yeah. is really the Don't message. Don't try to pretend or yes. you think no Chinese like red. This but is it's true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> For a lot of cosmetic brands during the Chinese New Year, they come up with a you know, totally <laughs> red package, no foundation or pressed powder. Yeah, but at the same time, if you don't put red on Chinese New Year, it's a problem. Look. <laughs> Sorry? Very, very well. And the Chinese president offered this, bo uh, offered this bottle to Macron, the French president, for this visit. Uh, other questions in the audience? No? Oh, okay. Yes.
thank you. Um, I feel like the diversity in scent might be lacking, especially if I compare different Korean brands. And it's more a bit more focused on like the marketing aspect, the packaging, the concept. Um, I wanted to ask you if you think it is an interesting market in terms of the diversity of scent. It really depends on the brand, what you are looking for. Uh, in China, true, the so-called key opinion leader inferences is uh, very important. There's um, quite a number of brands focus on that. But at the end of the day, uh, I would say still the products will speak. Thank you. If I may add just one thing, uh, because I think we are going to a close now to this uh, session. Uh, I'd like to give a public thank you to Mathieu. You no, know, it's true. Because in the choice of the good partner, if Mathieu hadn't been there, we would never be where we are today in China. Uh, I think it's important also to know how can you, uh, after m many choices, many failures, to find someone who can help you identify the correct partner. And, um, and really, Mathieu, uh, thank you very much for everything you. you've been doing to us. <laughs> uh, just, excuse me. <laughs> not just Sorry. design, not just design. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I wanted to add you, to tell you something else, and this is, I, if you want to understand also how the, the key topic, so Dolce Gabbana is the, the horrible situation, and the excellent situation is what happened to Cartier five years ago when they made the, the, the full exhibition inside the Forbidden City mm -hmm. with their most incredible uh, two centuries um, jewel. Uh, and they select the, the, the most incredible piece of Cartier according to how they were inspired. For example, how uh, uh, the, the Jeanne um, Toussaint, sorry, Jeanne Toussaint, the designer of uh, Cartier, was mm -hmm. inspired by China. And they put inside the Forbidden City. And this, it was like, you know what I mean? You, you cannot have a biggest declaration of love to a culture mm -hmm. than to make that. It sounds like being authentic, you know, but being uh, authentic to, yeah. to your uh, history yeah. and not trying to invent yeah. and, and just kind of piggyback on something. Okay, well, if there's no, no other questions, we'll wrap up and uh, please enjoy the rest of the show and uh, look for the replay. Okay. Yeah.